Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this special edition of HR Mentorship Learning Series. And today we have someone very special, a veteran and HR industry practitioner, Mrs. Taiwo Dayo Abaton, popularly called TDA. And she'll be sharing with us tonight on a topic we have coined My HR Journey, Key Lessons and Insights. She'll be sharing with us on our HR Journey, Key Lessons and Insights. She is currently the Regional Head, Sub-Sahara Africa with VFS Global. As part of this part of tonight's session, I'll be reading her profile and I need you to pay attention because our citation is actually an integral and intentional part of this program and I hope people will be inspired and blessed even as you listen and also pay attention intentionally our profile and projecting it so that you can also follow me as I share our profile all right she's an exemplary professional with an illustrious career spanning over a quarter of a century 25 years Taiwo Dayo Abaton stands as an accomplished HR specialist who has redefined the landscape of human resource management, currently serving as the esteemed regional head of HR Sub-Saharan Africa for VFS Global. She commands a realm spanning more than 30 strategic locations, orchestrating human capital strategies that resonate with the organization's overarching corporate mission. Taiwo's journey into the echelons of HR leadership include our role as the group head of human capital and corporate services at Primera Africa Finance Group. In this role, she masterfully navigated the complex terrain of strategic planning, organizational leadership, change management, process automation, and so on and so forth. Her prowess extended beyond conventional roles as she assumed the mantle of a thought partner, driving forward the human capital agenda with an astute blend of innovation and foresight. Okay. Before her role at Primera Africa Finance Group, Taiwo held pivotal positions at esteemed organizations, leaving an incredible mark of expertise and leadership. A tenure at Mutual Benefit Assurance PLC as Group Head, Human Resources and Administration, saw her skillfully managing HR activities and initiatives across four subsidiaries spanning Nigeria and the West African coast, boasting a formidable workforce of over 4,000 individuals. In addition, she played a pivotal role as head of human resources at Total Health Trust Limited, a member of Liberty South Africa. During her six year stint, she proved instrumental in driving the strategy for people and cultural change as the company underwent a transformational journey. And she also managed the enterprise into a fully corporatized entity after a hundred percent takeover by Liberty. Taiwo's commitment to academic excellence finds expression in a second class upper degree in economics from the University of Adwekiti, followed by a master's in business administration with a specialization in management from the Federal University of Technology, Akure. Her first a test for knowledge was further acquainted through associations with prestigious institutions like the London Academy Business School and the Olushola Lanre Coaching Academy. This extensive academic foundation led to accreditation as a certified coach, mentor, and career counselor, placing her at the zenith of HR leadership. The embodiment of her commitment to professional growth find expression in our membership in esteemed bodies, including the Chartered Institute of Personnel Management of Nigeria, CIPM, the International Coaching Federation, ICF, Association of Professional Facilitators and Trainers Manage in Africa, APFTIA, the Nigerian Institute of Management, NIM, 
Nigerian Institute of Training and Development, NITAD, or NITAD, the Institute of Pro Professional Managers and Administrators, IFMA. She is a certified senior professional in human resources, SPHRI. She stands as an exemplar of HR excellence. Taiwo's impact has transcended traditional HR roles, encompassing esteemed board positions and faculty roles. She serves on the advisory council of the Association of Professional Counselors and Trainers in Nigeria, and as a member of the board of trustees of the Power Women Network. Additionally, Taiwo is the advisory board chair of HR Expo Africa, the visionary force behind the continent's premier work festival. Taiwo's influence has extended globally through her esteemed faculty positions at consulting firms. She imparts her insight and expertise as a faculty member at Betts Consulting and Belfort Consulting and lectures with the Rome Business School in Nigeria. Additionally, Taiwo holds a distinguished advisory board position at Vantage Consulting Canada. As a way of giving back to the HR profession, finding expression for our calling and fulfilling our passion, which is impacting and improving professionals. Taiwo is the founder and host of Taiwo Coffee Chat, a capacity building platform for HR professionals and holds this free attendance event, which is already in its ninth edition. The HR Foundry, a learning platform for building and raising exceptional HR professionals with over 1,000 members, both in Nigeria and the diaspora. She also recently started a mentoring platform called Premium Mentoring Program with TDA. She mentors young female professionals, as well as a weekly Instagram live session called HR Banters with TDA. Taiwo's impact has resonated. Globally, as evidenced by a constellation of awards and accolades that are done a journey. Notable among these, as I will be mentioning these awards, Please, I like to be seeing accolades, emojis, emoticons on the screen. All right. So we take it one after the other. 2014 CIPM HR Best Practice Award, runner up. 2017 Best Practice Award, winner, health sector. 2019 Top 50 Nigerian Influencers on LinkedIn, Sales Ruby. 2019, Revenue Leadership Award, Premium Content Creator, Sales Ruby. 2020, Africa LinkedIn Influencer Award, HR Recruiter Category, Tech Times Africa. 2020, Top 250 HR Influencer in the World, Social Medical. 2020 HR Thought Leadership Award, Sales Ruby. 2021 African Women Industrialization Award. 2021 30 Leading Women in HR, Wooden HCV. 2021 Top 100 Career Women in Nigeria, 9 to 5 Chick. 2021, 100 Power Women in Nigeria, Power Women Network. 2022, 122 top CHRO in the world, People Home. 2023, 100 Power Women in Nigeria, Power Women Network. Taiwo's influence reverberates beyond awards as she seamlessly combines roles as an author, trainer, mentor, and visionary. Her authored work, Climbing the Career Ladder for Success, stands as a beacon of guidance for young female professionals, permit me to add male to, navigating the corporate realm, a quintessential leader, 
Taiwo believes in the ethos of teamwork. Of course, she didn't come alone. She has a kind of fostering camaraderie that amplifies her accomplishments. In a multifaceted journey, Taiwo remains anchored by her role as a dedicated spouse and a nurturing parent, embodying the passion that fuels our professional odyssey. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, at last, to the glory of God, we have on this prestigious platform, Taiwo, <laughs> Dayo, Abato, Mrs. Over to you, my young diploma. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm honored to be here. I don't take it for granted. It's a privilege. I know it's taken us almost a year to be here today. Thank you. You also demonstrated a, a virtue that I've also that I've, I've also emulated, and that, that is resilience. You were patient with me, uh, and and yet you were painstaking. And then today is happening. We'll still be talking about this skill I just talked about. Um, good evening, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, wherever you are connecting from um, around the world. It's an honor and a privilege to be joining uh, this session this evening. Uh, and I want to welcome you. I do not have any slides. It's a storytelling. Storytelling is also one of the ways we are practicing our profession as HR. Um, for us, even as mentors and coaches, yes, storytelling is a tool uh, that we use to help people to gain clarity. Uh, along their life's journey. So who is here with me? Who is here with me? If you are here, I want to see those emojis. I want to see those emoticons and let's just roll. So just imagine that um, our aircraft is taxiing now and we're about to take off. I want to welcome everybody on the call. And if you are able to type, just drop your first name and uh, where you are connecting from on planet Earth. I've been introduced, wonderful profile and all glory to God, you know, we do not plan for all this, but, you know, things just happen. Um, so it's storytelling, and I would not be saying things that, um, I'm going to be practical. My mentees know me. I'll be practical. I'm going to share my high and low moments. I'm going to share my pain, and I'm going to share the lessons that have taken me this far. Yes, 25 years, March this year, Make it exactly 25 years that I've been in the corporate world, and it has indeed been a journey. So the topic is my HR journey, lessons and insights. So I will tell the story, and I will tell the lesson, and I will share the insight. All put by in that about an hour, because I want us at least 30 minutes, 30, 20 minutes um, to ask questions um and, and then be able to address your pain points once again you're welcome my name is Taiwo Daya Baton popularly known as CDA okay so how did I start first of all I want us to be able to go to the chat room how many of us who work with owner managed enterprises owner managed enterprises if you're here on the call from today don't call one man businesses we call them owner managed enterprises Is it me? Can we still hear TDA? Can any of the admins confirm if they can still hear TDA? I want to be sure it's not my own network. Okay. We can't hear. We can't hear. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll wait for her. About, um, I said I'll be breaking some tables and I'll be um, helping some people change their mindset about some things. I never read human resources. I read economics. So first and foremost, if you're on this call, it's not about where you're coming from, it's about the journey ahead. It's not about where you're coming from, it's about the journey ahead. So I, I read economics at my first degree, and then I joined a bank, started working with the bank. Uh, the second thing I want to drop here is that you need, that, that, I don't afford chances. 
life does afford for chances. You need to chart your course um, as early as possible. So I grew up in an academic environment. My parents, my father was a professor in a university. My mother was a university administrator. Um, yes, in a university. Then in the university, we did not have uh, what we call human resources. So we had uh, the registry and we had the admin. Uh, and my mother was a, a, a registrar. She retired as a deputy. So I was starting with my journey to say that I, I grew up in, a, in, a, in an academic environment. My father was a university professor. My mother was a university administrator. Then we used to go to mommy's office and we'll see them carrying files. Uh, I, I was saying that she retired as a deputy registrar in the premier university in Nigeria. That's University of Ibadan, where I grew up. Uh, and I said that, um, yes, we used to go to her office. And then people used to carry files. And now we hear things like, Mr. A is going on leave. Who will be relieving Mr. A? Um, she was in the registry. I loved the human interactions. I love the human interactions that was going on there. And I also, what, what I observed then as young as I was, was I used to see the joy in her, in her eyes when she solves people's problems. So I said, I finished and I went to you. NYSC and from NYSC I started working with the bank and I was a funds transfer. Yeah, somebody's asking, did I go to ISI? Yes, I went to ISI, International School in Badoa. And then um, I, I started working in the bank and I was a funds transfer officer. And all I was doing in that bank was to issue bank drafts, uh, post salaries at the end of the month for customers. And then at times I would be at the front line um, helping customers to check their balances. I knew at that point, that was what I was cut out for. Because at the end of the day, once it's four o'clock, we'll lock the doors and they will go back in and punch in the figure so that we could run what we call end of day. So we run the end of day and we print out that manual as a 10 uh, to, so that the, that the customer care person would use to check balances for customers. This was 1997, 98, 99. I knew at that point, and I will go back home and I'll be crying because I just felt I would like to spend my life in front of a machine or in front of machines, punching figures. I want to interact with people. Uh, I knew as I was growing up that my father used to tell us something that we everyone had to write a story about themselves. You need to write your own story. So when you see people who are successful today, success stumble success. You chat cause in success. So the second thing I'll drop here, you have to be intentional, you have to be deliberate about your career. Whether you somersaulted into HR, whether you stumbled into it, whether they handheld you, whether somebody gave you an opportunity, from today, make up your mind, you will chart a course for yourself. Uh, whether you were accidental or anything into the profession you are in, make up your mind today that you're gonna to write your own story. You're gonna own your life and you're gonna be deliberate about it. So uh, I started, finding a way to see how can I get out of here. Yeah, banking was fine. It was in the 1990s, late 1990s, it was, it was the best that could happen to you was be a banker, be in that black and white suit or be in that navy blue and, and light blue suit. But that wasn't what I was caught for. But there's no copying. You can't copy anyone. Don't join the bandwagon. It may not pay you at the beginning, but what will keep you going is the confidence and, and the assurance you have in the path you have charted for yourself. So then my friends who were banked, even my twins were making it, but I chose to go and work with an owner managed enterprise somewhere in a phone bomb with a two room. The man had his office and he had a cleaner and I came in. And while I was there, I was there for nine years and six months. You know, it's like when God takes, took Moses, I went to go and keep him somewhere and it was being groomed and nurtured wherever you are today you may think you are wasting time you may think you are not shining as expected that is your nurturing ground that is your nurture you are, you are going through a time of nurturing no time is wasted you are going through a time of nurturing so i was in that one man business from three and nine years and four months that i was there that single business had five subsidiaries and I ended up leaving that place when they had 80 employees. So you might, can imagine the kind of work 
that went through that nine years and four months that I worked with that owner managed enterprise. If you're on this call and you're working with an owner managed enterprise, the mindset we have, oh, they're unethical, they don't have policies, or they don't have processes. And there is still a lot of things for you to learn there. The first thing you will learn there that could help anybody is the entrepreneurial mindset. Entrepreneurial mindset. You need to have that mindset to be able to ace it in the place of work. Not even saying now that companies have issues. Companies are looking for helpers. They're not looking for dependents. Companies are looking for people, solution providers. They are not looking for liabilities. So if you are going into an employment and you think, well, I'm getting that job. Oh, because I want my needs to be met. Oh, tick, tick, yes, your needs will be met. You are going there to render help. You are going to that organization to render help. So in nine years, four months, like I said, from three months, we became 80 and I bowed out. But let me tell you the journey in that nine years. I was the secretary, I was the cleaner, I was the accountant, I was the deputy CEO, I was the financier, I was the check writer, I was the signature to the account of that company for nine years and four months. And guess what, guys? I left there and all this happened from my early 20s till I was 31 years old. 33, nine years and four months that I spent there. So imagine having that kind of a responsibility at that young age. The company was into leasing, LPO financing, Forex trading. Um, uh, yes, so we used to we used to do a lot around Forex, but guess what? I was contented. One thing, another thing, contented. You have to be contented. Uh, there's a Yoruba adage. I'm going to share Christian. I will share scriptures, and I'm going to share adages. Uh, there's a scripture that there's an adage that says that the river which which you will drink from will not pass you, cannot overflow you. So one thing you have to learn is that you have to learn contentment. Contentment. Imagine handling dollars, foreign currency, in thousands. In it, uh, we used to bid with CBN, and I used to go to CBN to collect our own allocation of forex every week. We had a BDC license, and CBN was allocating I think five, uh, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to every BDC every Wednesday, and I would walk into CBN with that safe and go and pick those foreign currency, and they would disperse. And that, that, that went on for nine years and four months. Not a dime taken from that organization. The owner of that business is still alive. And he would, each time he speaks to me, I call him my, my number one mentor, my grand mentor. He would tell me, Taiwa, I'd always known that you're going places. People still ask after you. And I tell them, Taiwa is flying now. So you have to learn contentment. So when people come and they say, we're looking for your boss, or they call him, um, hello, I won't mention his name. We saw your secretary. I will just smile. But we saw that lady. Um, is she your cleaner, your PA, your secretary or something? I will just smile. But right in that organization, I learned Excel. Right in that organization, I learned PowerPoint. Right in that organization, I, I learned Adobe. I learned Microsoft Office. I ate it. Right in that organization, I went back for my master's run that organization, went back for my CIPM. It was, it was a grooming ground for me. Right in that organization, I took my first trip abroad. Right in that Imagine your MD writing to the embassy, telling the embassy to say, if Taiwo doesn't come back, seek my own passport or seek my own, cancel my visa. That was the level of trust and integrity that I gained in nine years and four months. I thought I'd lost time. I think my salary after that nine years will not even up to 200,000. But guess what, guys? It, after, that after that nine years, my acceleration started. So every one of us, we have a time of launching. Don't, don't rush. There's a time for you to be nurtured, a time for you to be nurtured, and a time for you to launch out. If you launch out before your time, your, your, your glory will be cut short. If you launch out before your timing, you will be like, you will fizzle out. You will fizzle out. So you have to go through that nurturing, that building, uh, equipping yourself, building capacity before you launch out. So there's a time. There's a time. 
um, you're welcome. So there's a time for you to launch out. So after my owner managed enterprise experience and I had gained capacity in terms of the soft skill, I talked about entrepreneurial skills. I talked about also the capacity. I did my, my master's, I did my CIPM, NIM, all those stuff. I also got married. And, and guess what, guys? I met my husband in the office. So most of us, while we are, uh, when you're going to work, go with the go with the mindset that it's still a stepping stone to your end. Go with the mindset that you're going to give in your best, even if the circumstances and the conditions are not okay. I told you the office was in the heart of a compound, but by the time I was living in in nine years and four months, we had moved to night house besides CBN. So look at that transformation. Came in as a single and eventually I got married. So I met my husband in the place of work. Let me quickly share that story. Somebody came, we had a transaction that went, that did not go well with one of the subsidiaries and the customer came and I heard somebody shouting at the front desk. Of course, being the oldest staff and the most senior, I took that responsibility to go and um, check who was there. Hello, sir, how are you? How may I will help you? He kept on making some, I said, can you please come into my office? And then I took him in and then I tried to sort out the issue and everything went well. I saw him off to the lift and he left. The next day, my MD then called me and said, tell me a customer came. I was trying to, you know, you know how we do now, cop up, oh, oh, sorry, we've managed it, everything is fine. He said, no, 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 a customer called me now. His name is Mr. Baton. I said, yes, he came in just now. That was the guy that I said had an issue. He said, it, I should tell you that you are his wife. I said, one day, one day, one day, you see all these customers and when you're trying to help them. Anyway, nine nine months later, we were married. Nine months later, we were married. And um, I think last week made it 21 years that I got married. I look back and I, and I, and I would ask, I would put something to it, which is that many of us are in opportunities. It might not be in the place of marriage because we think it's not my business. It doesn't concern me. It's another, pers it's another person's work. It's another department assignment. We lose opportunities. In my own case, it was a spouse. What if I hadn't come out of my office that day? What if, what if I hadn't attended to him? What if I was just rash to him? You never know whether somebody put it there. You're, you're, yes, so nine months, nine months, and we were married. Met him in October. By August the following year, we were married. And it's 21 years already. Uh, so I, if, if, it, if, I, if it's a marriage counselor session, we have, we have another story, another mindset about that. So we should make sure that we're not losing opportunities. We should come to work with the mindset that I'm going to render help. I'm a solution provider. I provide solutions. Uh, the world is waiting for me to unleash my potentials and I will give my best daily in the place of work. Let's move fast forward. So after I left uh, uh, the organization, I moved into another organization at a time that was very germane to them. The company was going through a cultural people transformation. And that was where I cut my teeth in people and cultural transformation. So I don't see myself as a regular HR. I'm not a BAU HR. I'm a change management expert. I'm a people and culture strategist. I come into your organization and I help you to align your people's strategies and initiatives with your agenda. And we marry together, and then the company starts to run. Um, some people say I don't stay long in organizations. Once I fulfill my agenda, I move. So I moved into that company. The fourth thing I would drop here, insight, is that only you can make your role beautiful. Only you can make your role beautiful. I'll say it again. You are the only one that can make your role, your position, your responsibilities beautiful. So when you are on your seat on a daily basis, you are asking yourself, what can I do better? What can I do better? How can I enhance the quality of the job I am doing or the quality of the service I am doing in this organization? We think those things are routine. We think they are routine. But I'm going to give you another insight. There is an I. There is always an I, either external or internal, that is looking at you. Standing before you here, 25 years work experience, I am a product of sponsorship. Every job I have gotten was through sponsorship. Somebody internal or somebody external stands there as a sponsor, and that is that I. 
that is that I. For my mentees, when I'm talking to them, they tell me that I speak at, from, at a higher realm. Sorry, um, I would try to be granular, but I speak from a, from a higher realm. There is that I in that organization looking at you. You never know. I got to know in one of the companies I work for that the MD stays behind or, or has access to all the emails of employees. So what he does at the end of the day is sit back and check who sent Taiwan an email, which email did she send, who sent what. So I'm going another way. Insight, how do you use the company's tools? What do you use those tools for? Um, most of us that our companies have intercom. We study intercom, intercom, talking about our colleagues. Those things have IVR, they are recorded, and somebody's playing back your conversations on the intercom. So we need to understand acceptable usage of company property. The next I'm going to say, so he sits back and checks everybody's emails. So we were at a meeting one day and he said, we were, we were talking about something that happened. And then we were talking management meeting it was a man call meeting. And he said, well, all of you here, I would say when it comes to ethical practices, I know that our HR is doing well. I looked up, he said, she's the only one who sends an email and doesn't BCC anyone. You know, we do it amongst ourselves. You are sending an email to your colleague, but you have one or got somewhere that you think is your sponsor or he thinks has your back, and you are busy seeing that person, basically trying to report your colleague to that person. They're checking you out. They're seeing it. So I, I don't BCC, and up to now I don't BCC. I'm very frontal and very assertive. I will CC whoever I want to CC in that email. When I have a communication with you the first time, don't respond to me. The second time, I'm taking to the sex first level escalation. I will see either your line manager or the MD or the unit directorate or something. I will see openly. So I would say again, don't be CC people. Don't be CC. One day, the cat will come out of the bag. Um, and it speaks to your ethical practices in the workplace. So we're moving on. So, you know, for those of us who are middle managers, with we're, we're a lot in that in that category. So you are now an AM, you are a DM, you are a full manager. We're a lot of us. How do you stand out? How do you stand out? Yes, don't snitch on people, Valentine. Thank you. Don't snitch. Say it openly. Um, how do we stand out in the midst of the crowd? We, we're in that category. You know, it's a funnel. It goes thinner as you go go up. And so if all of you are down there and you're thinking, I'm putting in the work, I'm putting in all the effort, but I'm not getting um, that rapid move as I expect within this organization. We need to understand everybody needs to learn when your time is up. Many of us, we already dinosaurs where we are working. Know when your time is up, know when you have rendered enough value and know when to leave when the ovation is high, is at the highest. You need to learn that. The second thing is that you need to get a sponsor. Now, most of us think that you get sponsorship because you are, you are going up there to go and report Taiwo to the ED operations. You are going up there to go and report Taiwo to the CFO. You are going to report people to the leaders up there and they take you, they would use you. Leaders would use you. And they will throw you up when it is when you need them the most. Now, I was thinking about leadership. A leader would not compromise their name or whatever they stand for when, when the chips are down. I've seen leaders throw people off at decision table. They would rather keep their name. They will throw you off. Meanwhile, you have been the one. But if you're on the call and that's what you do, ask yourself, how has it paid you? They haven't promoted you. They haven't bought a car for you. They haven't done anything better for you. You see earning the same salary. So ask yourself, does this thing pay me? It doesn't pay you. They are entrepreneurial in their mindset. The, the workplace is war. It is war. And so you are fighting wars every day and you are being used as a pawn. Stop it. I'm not saying don't go up there. Go up there. But the only reason why you're going up there is because you want to go and sell yourself. Many of us don't know how to sell ourselves. You don't have to, you have to learn how to sell yourself. And you sell yourself 
when you are in middle management in three different ways. One, aligning with the company's policy and processes. I can categorically say that until I got to my, to my current role, I am always the first person to resume in my department. Nobody who, I have some of my colleagues on the call who have worked with me one-on-one. -on -one. I get to work before everybody in my team. I get to work before everybody in my team because I am the leader and I should take that sacrifice and lead by example. So while they are working at 8 o'clock, I've been there since 6.45. I've started a plan for the department for the day. So they're getting my email. They have to try and so on. So please fix this. Please do this. I've aligned, I've assigned responsibilities to them. But most of us who are bosses on this call, we're working at 8 o'clock with our head raised high. Maybe even someone will have even carried our laptop and our bags from the car to us. And then we walk in. We are creating a mindset and an impression. And they say that perception rules the world. Can I give you a secret? There's somebody in your team who has the ears of somebody up there that gives them information about you, per se, per se. The time you come in, they'll say, Taiwo just came in now. The time you leave, she just left now. Carrying a red bag, she wore blue shoes. They are seen up there. You never know. So the mindset I would say that we should earn own today is that first of all, we're in the office, no friends in the office, we are all colleagues. We are first of all colleagues. When you understand office relationship that we are first of all colleagues, you will start to act from a professional angle. In your communication, it's professional. In your dealings with people, it's professional. No packaging with anybody, no aligning with anybody, because when the chips are down, the secrets will come out. Many of us are being denied benefits, promotions, movements here and there because we do not know what somebody else has said about us. I've said on the call before, the people in your team can either be your albatross to, to your success or be your best cheerleaders. The people in your team, your team members, how are you relating with them? Because you never know who are the gatekeepers in the organization you work for. Guess what? We, the leaders at the top, we're not the gatekeepers. Somebody comes up there to give us the information that we work on. So what value and support are you giving to your teams? Because I'm waiting. My internet connection is unstable. If you're still with me, just let me know. Somebody should unmute and tell me. Tell Where, are we here. Where are we with you, ma'am? Fantastic. So they could either be your albatross or your best cheerleader. There's somebody talking about you in the canteen. There's somebody talking about you in the staff bus. There's somebody talking about you to that person up there. Um, and so you have created an impression or you have created an, a, a, a perception about yourself that you yourself never knew. They know you more than you know yourself because somebody talking about you to them. So ask yourself, how have I packaged myself? How have I presented myself? When the leaders are talking and they mention Taiwan Baton, what would three out of five say? What would three out of five say? What would four out of five say? Who can stand in my defense? And I'm going somewhere, particularly for those of us who are women on the call. I can say categorically, in the last three organizations I've worked for, I'm the, I've been the only woman in leadership. And when I mean leadership, executive management. In one of my lives, I wouldn't want to mention that name. The company is over 25 years old, and I became the first female in Exco at the 25th year. So you can imagine what battle I had to fight to become the only woman and how I stayed there till I left. We women in organizations, organizations need us. But we need to do a lot away from the way we present ourselves as women. Society and culture tells us to always put forward our feminine side. Oh, I am beautiful. Oh, I am curvy. Oh, I can cry. Oh, I, I can show my sentiments as a woman. It won't take you far. It won't take you further. Because at a particular level in your in career, it is competence that earns you that seat, not your femininity. It is competence that earns you that role and not your femininity. You also need to understand how men are wired. Men are very decisive. See, the man sees you today. 
they determine, they know in their mind. And if the men on the call, I can see my brother, Emmanuel, like well, the call. And I can, if you are a man on the call, just tell me, Taiwo, yes, Taiwo is true, or Taiwo it is wrong, or just give me an emoji or, or an emoticon. When a man sees you from the first time, he knows whether he's going to marry you, he's not going to play with you. They are very decisive. Men take decisions. Oh, thank you. And see, somebody say yes. So, um, oh, thank you. All the men, you'll be telling me whether I'm right or wrong. They know where they are going. Men are, they don't, they don't beat around the bush. They don't. They know where they're going to. So when you're on that table with them, when you're on that table with them, I told you I got married in nine months. Nine months. You're on that table with them. How are you? You need, you need to know how men are wired. They are very decisive. They are a bit opinionated. Men are very logical. We are very emotional. We are intuitive. They are very logical. It to them, A plus B will give us C. And you see them in strategic positions. You see them in leadership. Because they are strategic in their thinking. They are technically wired. They are decisive. They know what they want and they go for it. So for you as a woman to sit amongst them, you need to begin to understand how they are wired. So I've had situations whereby we're in meetings. The first, that was the first thing I learned. You don't display emotions or sentiments in, in the meeting. And I told my mentees, some of them on the call, I said, at this stage, I don't think and I don't feel. And I'm saying it again. If you tell me that, if I say, so we are saying this, I think that I feel that, what that means is that if your feelings change tomorrow, decisions will change. If you're thinking and your mindset change tomorrow, then your decisions will, think, will change. So to move at, at that level, we stop thinking, we stop feeling, we start working with data and information. We start working with data and information. Let me go back a bit and see how have I moved. If you, if you read what they said, I have moved across almost all the sectors of the economy. I've been in banking, I've been in financial services, I've been in insurance, I've been in healthcare, I've been in FMCG, I've been in quick service business, I've been in um, uh, yeah, quick service, FMCG, banking, financial services, and I'm currently in travel and diplomatic missions. Now, let me tell you how I moved from being a local HR in Nigeria to becoming global in my mindset and currently where I work. It's also a strategy. It, it, it didn't just happen. At a point in time, I started looking at the HR sphere in Nigeria and I, I, I found out it was a bit proliferated. We're all saying the same thing. We're all gunning for the same jobs. Um, and of course, is that how you wish somebody dead or, or, or something, you can't people's jobs. How do I now begin to prepare myself and make myself feel more relevant um, beyond the shores of Nigeria into the global space? I've checked some of the recordings I've done in the past and I, and I, I laugh at myself. And I would say that I've actually, actually also gone through some form of transformation and it's deliberate. So once again, you have to be intentional and you have to be deliberate about everything you are doing. So what I did was to go back, and I said, in the beginning, I said, you have to cost for yourself. What must I do to launch myself beyond the shores of Nigeria into the global space? And I started developing myself. Uh, most of us love to flaunt our certificates and flaunt all the trainings we've gone. Yes, it's good, but there's a place of knowledge. There's a place of wisdom. Uh, the knowledge you're acquiring, how are you relating that and, uh, uh, and using that in the place where you work? So I'm not saying you shouldn't acquire those things. Currently, I was sharing with my mentees, I have 35 courses that I've allocated for myself on one of the learning platforms to, to be done between now and December, 35 courses. Um, some of them diploma courses, 35. And currently, as at end of August, I've done two. So I'm still not, I'm still doing badly, but I'll still do the 35 by December. That's how deliberate I am about knowledge and acquiring knowledge. I may not have to, uh, to flaunt it. What must I do to get to that global space? First of all, uh, one of the things we need to understand is that we have to learn cultural intelligence. Many of us are not culturally aware. We're not. 
in our speech, in our communication, in how we relate with people, we ex exhibit and demonstrate so much bias. And if you want to transcend into the global space, you need to be culturally aware. And I'll just say four things. First is that you need to, um, first of all, acknowledge everybody's culture. Culture is the way of life of everyone. And it means that they, that, that they really do how they relate. So there's no bad culture. It suits them, it suits their way of life. Same thing with religion. So you first of all have to acknowledge. Many of us are in denial. You need to acknowledge people's culture, people's mindsets, people's opinion, people's religion. The second thing is that you need to come to a place of acceptance. You cannot change them. And that because you're coming to a place of acceptance, you, are, you become more uh, accommodated. You have to be accommodating of people. The third thing is that you have to change your communication. Change your communication. You can't, if you want to be, if you want to be global, you can't be talking like a local. Uh, I've had, yes, you're saying that it causes I'm still battling with it. Well, don't worry. I'm an oldie, you know now, you know, we are where we are connected. So what am I saying? You have to change your communication. If you look at how we started so far, I have tried not to use any Nigerian parlance in my communication. I know this will be circulated on YouTube. It will go global. And so in my communication, as much as possible, you want to be um, a bit more uh, suspect in how you communicate so that it will have to take a research for them to know who is talking and where you're talking from. I've talked about culture, you need to understand that. The fourth thing you need to understand is that you have to have respect for everybody. You have to respect people. So I started deliberately trying to connect with foreign nationals. And that I did that very well on LinkedIn, not knowing that I was preparing myself for a global opportunity. Uh, and then I started attending seminars, conferences across the shores just to have an idea of what's happening in the other, other space, other side of the world, um, in South, Central and East, in West Africa, in Africa as a whole, in the Middle East, in Russia, in Europe. What are the peculiarities that they begin to mind around what we do here in Nigeria? For interprofessionals on this call in Nigeria, we're doing fantastic, we're doing phenomenal, but we can still do more. We can still do more. We'll say that. So I, I had to do that, connect the people, build, I built relationships with people across the borders, changed my communication to make it more, to have a global feel, changed my orientation around, around religion, around biases, male, female. We have 14 different kinds of sexual orientation, ladies and gentlemen, 14, and still counting. So here we talk in Nigeria, we are talking, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. When you know other clients, another person is saying, I'm not a lady, I'm not a gentleman. You are showing a bias towards me because you have not addressed me as an individual. So we say hello, everyone, so that we are encompassing. In, in every, we are putting everybody together because we talk about DEIB, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belongingness. So it's hello, everyone. I wouldn't say good evening or good afternoon. I would say good day. Because I don't know for which client, which environment, the person, where I am, I'm speaking with, I'm connecting with, is connecting with me from. So yes, we could Google that. How do I, how do I, when we say we stand on existing protocol, it's only in Nigeria that we say stand on existing protocol. It's only in the protocol you're standing on. Protocol is not an object that we're standing on. So, so, yeah, that happened. I connected, I checked my communication, and guess what? The global opportunity came. Global opportunity came. Uh, currently, in the organization I work for, uh, in senior leadership, I'm the only black face and the black woman in senior leadership of the company that I work for. Uh, a privilege. On, now, say one thing I have to do mindset. We have some mindsets. Oh, I am black. Oh, I am disadvantaged. Oh, they cannot look for me. Um, I'm not wanted. We are wanted. You are wanted. You are important in the scheme of things. You are relevant. And that is it. Now, let me go back a bit again. 
for us as HR, we need to be embracing. There is, HR is not an end. HR is a means to an end. I've seen HR directors who eventually became MDs of organizations. I've seen HR directors became eventually became directors of organizations. HR is not an end. Or oh, the pick I want, I want, I want some target. So I'm not in there. No, HR is a means to an end, and that is why we need to become strategic in our mindsets. I knew back as far back as ten years, I had gone for finance for non-finance managers. Back at ten years, with a balance sheet, a PLN account, statement of income account, all of financial statements, so that when the finance guy is speaking his jargons at the segment meeting, they have noted that some things are going to, to say. And this, this is, these are the things that you do that gives you visibility. So when I say any questions for finance, for finance, after your man call meeting, everybody says no. You what the finance guy has bamboozled all of us. I will raise up my hand and say, can you please go back to the PRN account and look at the line item, lend and development. I recall that this month of August, from my own calculation, we only spent three million on learning and development. Can you please let me know how the three million became seven point five million, and everybody will start laughing. Obviously, the finance guy had done some padding, but I've been able to challenge that and say that line item belongs to me, which I know I spent three million, but you are putting seven point five million there. So you better tell me how three million became seven point five, and we we, we had things like hotel less that offline. But I'm striking a chord in the mind of my MD to say this girl basically knows more than HR. Many of us sit at meetings and we're a fly on the wall. Don't be a fly on the wall. We do that all the time. Let me just go. I'll just be quiet. I won't ask. I won't ask any question if you don't ask me any question. Please don't be a fly on the wall. I told you that they are looking at you. It's a couple of you. It's an helicopter view, and they are looking so that when we start down and they're looking for who are we moving up with leadership, who can be Laos? Then they say, okay, let's pick this person, let's pick this person, let's pick this person. Also, make volunteer yourself for assignments in the organization. Show up and show up well. Opportunities, there's only one, one opportunity you have to prove yourself. And once you lose that five minutes, you've lost it. You've created an impression and a perception in their minds that become very difficult to erase. Become very difficult to erase. Now, I've said so many things. It sounds interesting, but I'll say that one thing I did was that I got a mentor. I've, got, I've, I've had mentors across different areas of my life. And for professional, uh, for HR, I was humble enough a few years back to release myself for mentoring under Yemi Fashion. I can say comfortably that whatever I am today in terms of my profession, I owe a bit of it to him because I stood low to learn from him. And he really tutored me well uh, this far. Maybe now when he's addressing me, we'll say, Tywo, well, you are the boss. But he's the boss and he taught me a lot. I, 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 up to now, I defer to him. So for those of us, only me is doing this call, uh, for men, you cannot throw away mentorship. You cannot throw it away. I had a mentor uh, in the UK who mentored me all through 2020, 2021 on communication and presentation. And that was a one year dedicated mentorship. And that's by Dayolomu. Dayolomu was my mentor on communication. And the final assignment he gave me for the communication mentorship he did for me for one year was to get my book done. I said, I would have to end. You write your book. I want to see how you are communicating it. with branding. He helped me with my branding. So I got a mentor. Many of us think, oh, I'm there. I, I don't need to talk to anybody. But we are lacking. We are, there's so much rough edges. Yes, the Toastmaster. Yeah. Yes, he is. We are lacking in so many areas that all you need to do is just subject yourself to a mentor. Now, let me tell you something. Mentors are not perfect. I am not perfect. I think for some of my mentees, they've seen my worst side. They've seen the bad of me for some of them because I, 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 at the beginning, I will tell you, I'm going to be as open as possible to you, no it, and I'm not going to pretend. This is who I am. So most of us, we judge people, particularly leaders, with, with, with a colored, colored, look at them and what we're looking for 
flaws. We're looking for their flaws. We're looking for their flaws and their imperfections. Meanwhile, yours is to look at what that person has done, what value or skill or virtue that person is demonstrating that you can emulate. So you're not going to that relationship relationship because you like that person, because you can't that person. You want to say, this person wants to work. I want to be mentored around from qualities. How does he or she do it? And you go for it, and then you step back. Mentorship is a no judgment zone. It's a no judgment zone. You're not going there to judge that person. That person is not coming there to judge you. And of course, information management and privacy becomes very key under that veil called mentorship. Another topic entire I was in for them. So I got a mentor. Let me tell you, I've been saying the besides, let me share some bad experiences I've had in the place of work. I have been denied also because I was brash and I wasn't emotionally intelligent. Look at this scenario. We're in a meeting, a management committee meeting. That's man committee. And line manager, a counterparty, um, comes at me at a meeting. And I get wild. That's unacceptable of you. That's a bias of demonstrating. It became so heated, and I have to say, admitting, Mr. MD, sir, I need to leave this meeting now because I cannot predict my next behavior. That was what I told the MD. But 30 people in that room. I need to leave this meeting now because I cannot predict my, um, my, my behavior, my next move. You know, we always say, yeah, I want to give everybody a piece of my mind. When you give them the piece of your mind, what is left of the mind? When you dispute all the pieces of your mind, that's who I am. That is not who you are. You need to be emotionally intelligent. Oh, that is who I am. I cannot change. Nobody should just man change me. That is me. That is not you. You just lack emotional intelligence. So the MD cut the meeting short and said we should both meet him in his room, in his office. I still refused because I was boiling. I refused to see the MD. The MD came down to the meeting room and he said, um, um, Taiwo, I know you think they're very important to us. You know, most times we think we're the best that happened happened or has happened to that company after sliced bread. Many of us, we're we on a, we've put ourselves on a pedestal that we think, oh, we're the best that has happened to the entire universe after sliced bread. I know that sliced bread is very soft. When you take a bottle and you roll sliced bread, nothing is left in that sliced bread. But that's how we see ourselves. And so it came, you know, you're important to us, you are valuable, you know, uh, how you behave at that meeting, and da 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 He said, I didn't like the way he spoke with me. It was not right. The guy also came. It was a party. It was even a level ahead of me, but we were both uh, HODs. And he said, okay, I'm sorry. And I felt, oh, I had one. Guess what? It was an email I got summoning me to the board, to the board governance committee. For another behavior in the workplace. The minute I got that email, I knew that I was in for it. Then I'm going to talk, I'm going to, talk to resign. And something was just wrong. Uh, many of us prepare our speech. So oh, I did prepare my speech. I went back. That is why you need to build strategic relationships in the workplace. Many of us have forced relationships. There's some relationships that you use only once. You just keep it. It's called a lifeline. Some, there are some lifelines you need to have in the place of work. Not a lifeline that you just use anyhow. You have them there. Just, you just say hello to them. You do it. Check it out. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? Your yeah, lifeline. I went back to look at my lifelines. And I, I, I spread out three people. Somebody who could speak with the chairman on my behalf. Somebody who could, who could speak with the MD on my behalf. And I went to tell them what happened. As I, I've messed up. There's a board committee meeting tomorrow. And I'm going to appear at that board committee. I need, you need to bail me out. You know, because... Uh, you also have to find a way of depositing into people's emotional bank accounts. Some people who are strategic, MD, know his wedding anniversary, know his birthday. When you are talking to your MD, hello, sir, how are you, sir? I, I, I love your suits. Oh, nice. So it was my wife that they were taking my wife bought it for me with such pain. So you know that he loves his wife and he loves suits. Okay, where do you buy your suit? Paris? It's really nice. Oh, it's Italian. Oh, nice. You don't know what type of suit. For you know that when you keep telling the end that you love this suit, his eyes brightens up. You must know what costs it for people. They put into their emotional bank accounts. Ask about their children, about their family, how was their weekend? Just walk around, take a walk around in the office when you get there. So you build these relationships. 
So I went and I used my lifeline and I went for the board committee meeting. Yes, everybody said whatever they want to say. I would I wasn't too good. Da, 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 da. It became the chairman's decision at that point. I was always fantastic towards the organization. We cannot afford to let her go. Uh, from the way she has spoken this afternoon, we, I want to believe she has learned her lessons. And let, let's allow it to go. That something must have gone wrong that day. Uh, um, so we're waving it for her. We are waving it for her. And that was how I escaped being sacked in that organization. I went back to the other person, we shook hands, um, and then that went. But I learned a, a very good le a lesson there. The second story I'm going to give you is that many of us flaunt our relationship in the office. You know, the MD, the MD is my father's brother's uncle, daughter's son's, you know, niece and nephew. You know, in the operation, uh, it's from my hometown. Oh, you don't know, Ajoke? Ah. Yeah, Ajoke now, the, the CFO. We went to secondary school together. No, we, we, we come way back. We flaunt, we openly flaunt our relationships in the office, thinking it will give us an edge, but at the end of the day, it come back to haunt us. Alex, an employee's mom wants to do her birthday. It's out of town. The company's policy support employees to rejoice with themselves. So they release the staff bus to pick employees who want to go to, to rejoice with the other employees. So the employee requested for this boss. But because the employee is very popular, the staff boss would not suffice. So the employee will go to the MD and say, I will need two other vehicles to pick additional people for the event. MD says, good, but go and apply through admin. So go and do an email to admin to release additional two vehicles. Admin will send it to me, I would have Employee goes to the admin manager and says, I require two more vehicles. Admin manager says, no, but the policy is very tough. And you tell the admin manager, sorry, I've spoken to the MD. And the MD said, you should release two other vehicles. Actually, I'm going to send you an email. You can forward it to him and get the approval. What do you think just happened there? Just slap the admin manager in the face. Admin manager writes the email to the MD. MD approves, but she walks up to the MD and says, this is what has happened. You are undermining my responsibility in this organization. And guess what? MD, MD allows them to go for the event, to come back, and MD calls the employee and says, never, ever again flaunt your relationship with senior leadership with other employees. Many of us do it, thinking that is your sure banker for your promotion, thinking that is the leverage you have, thinking that makes you invincible in the organization. And that was another lesson I, I learned. That was me. That was a lesson I learned. That was a lesson I learned. So, so I worked in one of my lives. The owner of the, of the, of the business, not that one-man business, a conglomerate that I um, And the ED of the, uh, the, 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 the two most important organization were telling cousins to my mom. And I worked in that company for years. Nobody knew that I had any relationship with them. I don't go to their office, I don't talk to them, nothing. I got to my role as HR. It was at the sent forth, they now mentioned that they hadn't seen a professional like Taiwo. That are you guys aware? This is our relationship with her. And we're like, what, what, what? Never. So we should learn that stop wanting your relationship with people. It could come back to fight you. To fight you. If you've learned something so far, I begin to round up. Please drop it in the comment section. I want to I want to see uh, what we have learned so far in this um, in this story. So I've talked about my lead, my senior leadership, my being the woman in leadership, how men are wired, how they think, and then also to in the place of relevance. You need to know what you need to know. And I said the preparation. There's a piece of preparation. So my current role, I told you I had decided what I wanted to do. Uh, I talked spoken to you about mentorship. I was trying to see what, what would I go, what, I want to be in the global space, what must I do? And I found out what something that was most relevant in the global space, that life had evolved after COVID and A plus B was no longer seen the place of work. And that em companies were focusing so much on empathy, on empathy, on emotional intelligence, on cultural awareness. And what did I do? I found out that coaching as a skill had become the new gold. Coaching as a skill had 
new gold. Um, and I went for my coaching certification. That was two years ago. Never knew that was going to be part of the job description that I'm doing today. So I fit, I fit shedding like a glove in terms of qualification and requirement for my role. Coaching skills were needed. It was difficult. I had to hit through my nose to get that done. I sacrificed six months. I think it was about 20, 20 Saturdays and Sundays, four hours in a day to do that coaching certification. And that, that became relevant to me when I need this new job. So ask yourself, are you so complacent where you are? Are you so complacent where you are that you think you've gotten it all? I have CIPM, I have GPTA, I have SPHRI, I have... Currently, I'm doing a PMP because in the place of work, it's now project-based. It's projects going on. It's an additional skill that you need to have. Either you want to be a, sig a Sigma specialist or you want to be a Lean specialist, you need to get additional skills. People are doing their CBA to become a certified business analyst beyond HR. I think Lara Yuko just got her CBA. Fantastic skill. Data analytics. You need to begin to ask yourself. We're talking about artificial intelligence coming in or has come in or has taken over. I guess what must I do to become relevant? For those of you that know me very well on the call, if I receive something today, tomorrow is gone. I'm asking myself, what's the newest thing I'm getting? What's the newest thing? What's the newest thing? If after 25 years, I'm still, I got taught after five new courses that I want to, I must get between now and December. Not because the world and the world of work is evolving at an extremely fast rate. You need to also evolve or you end up becoming a dinosaur. Now, I've been in conversation with top leadership where they are saying, Taiwo, you need to replace so and so and so. And so so and so is still being very, very lackadaisical and laissez fair in his or her role. Meanwhile, we're already scouting for somebody outside. Several times. We'll groom outside and we'll find a way to just exit that person. Because as long as you're not the owner of the business, you're not a shareholder, you don't own shares, you're not a big owner, you do not know the conversations that are happening behind you. So I said something, show up and show up well. You need to show up and need to show up very well. Ask yourself where I am today. If my MD is not available to attend a meeting, they, can they call me to go for that meeting? Do I know the thoughts of leadership? Do I have a strategic plan? Can I speak the business language? Yesterday, or what was it? Uh, one day or Tuesday, I was sharing with my mentees that the program that runs in my organization, you're not eligible for it until you're three years or five years in the organization. I just spent 10 months in my organization yet on, on, on Thursday, maybe 10 months I joined my current employer and I got an email from my saying I've been nominated to attend that program. 10 months. So I did five years. What did I do in 10 months for them to nominate people for that program? While other attendees are either three years or five years that will be going for that program. 10 months going for that program. So what I do is basically go there in any way I'm going and say, what can I do differently? What can I do differently? How can I stand out? Somebody should write stand out. You need to stand out. And every one of us, we have a USP. How you look, your color, of your complexion, your eyes, your hair, there's a USP. You have a USP. But many of us are just, are just following the bandwagon. They are doing to do that. For me, I'm a one-man mopo. I'm a one-man police. I do not join the bandwagon. I am so strong on my ethics. I'm so strong on my values that drive me that I don't feel alone. I don't feel alone. If everybody's going left and I'm not convinced to go left, I go right. I just stay in my lane. And that's help. That's help. You need to discover who you are. Come to a level of self-awareness and know what drives you. How many of us have our vision and mission statement clearly written out in five lines? I can tell you mine. And I can tell you the values that drive me. Five values that drive me, I'll tell you. And this, and for those, if I say my values here and my mission statement, everybody would know. For those who have said, this is Taiwa Baton. If you want me to do that, I can share it with you. 
and everybody must go back this evening and chart their mission statement. What am I called to do? Who am I? And then what values drive me? Because the values that drive you will determine the people that you meet with, the people that you talk with, who the associations that the people that you keep it within your circle and will make you authentic. That's where your authenticity will lie, the values. Another thing that's helped me also as I round up is that you need to get an accountability partner. You need to be humble enough. Many of us who we have around us are yes people, people that will be hearing us. Hey, we're going, we are behind you. You are the best in the after that life bread. In fact, without it, there's no other person. It's only God. The, you have healers. Get an account accountability partner that can tell you the truth to your face. That can tell you, you're not, you're not doing well. Stop this. I, got, I had to get an accountability partner. I was that humble. I told you I got a mentor. I got mentors that helped me. I also got an accountability partner that could tell me the truth. That I said, so, so, so come. This one, this lecture that I just gave now, please give me feedback. I got one and I still have one. She's not even in Nigeria. But we connect regularly. We have I have a plan for the year. She has a plan for the year. It's okay, how are you faring here? What has you have you done so far here? Everybody must get an accountability partner. That you can tell the truth to yourself. You can cry together, you can pray together, you can share together. Very important. It's a lonely world out there, and you cannot do it alone. Get somebody of like mind, somebody who thinks like you, and get your own accountability partner. Very important. There are some people that you need in your lives, and I will round up by that. Five people, five people, and these are practical things. People that I've pulled into my own life and have helped me this last 25 years. The first people that you need, you need angels. Someone should write to them in the chat, in the chat room. You need angels. Many of us, we have skills, we have the passion, we have, we have, we have, but there's no body to announce us. Every, we have the qualification, we have everything. You need angels. I'm sorry, I've been a bit skipped around the spiritual. Yeah. Somebody must herald you. What do angels do? They are, they are heralders of good news. Who brought the notice that Jesus will be born? It was an angel that appeared to Elizabeth. To, to give birth to John the Baptist. An angel appeared to Mary. And they always bring good news and good tidings. And they come in human beings. They are human beings. They are angels all around us. Many of us have misused opportunities. We've been rude to people. We've been brushed to people. We've said bad things about people. People that God has found around you as angels. For me, I do not despise people. I may not talk to you in one year. I may not talk to you in five years, but I will maintain that relationship with you. I will maintain it because I have to talk about that. One day, one day, I may need this person. One, one day, I may need this person. For many of us, either out of pride, uh, stupidity, foolishness, we have misused people around us that should actually be there for us as angels. For one of my, the jobs I got, it was someone that I taught in CIPM study class that came to me and said, Ma, I'm a recruiter. I'm recruiting for this company. They need somebody for this role. And I said, okay, I'll give you CVs. My usual self wanting to help. And I sent CVs to her. They said, they, are CVs, Ma. they said the CVs are not attractive enough. And I'm with the business business. It's about three million. I said, eh, so what should we do? She said, Ma, give me a favor. Give me your own CV. Let me use that one to block the amount. I said, I'm not looking for a job. I'm not where I am. So my name just give them while we begin to look for more. And I sent my CV to her. Guess what? She called me and said, Ma, the MD of that company, the chairman of that company, says they want to meet you. I said, why, what's all this now? I didn't tell you I'm looking for jobs. Well, that asking is not what I'm looking for at this point. She said, my daughter, ladies and gentlemen, a week later, I got that job. What if I jettisoned her? She's my student. I don't need her for anything. What I do is a student. The current one I mean is somebody who is in diaspora who, are, who just says, hello, Taiwo, on LinkedIn. Hello, how are you? How is Nigeria? How is this? How is this? And he said, there's a joke.
Okay. So, yes, I, I don't know. The network threw me off. I think we maxed on to 100. Okay, so like I said, um, I think I said so much uh, this evening. Yes. It's, you were telling us about the five types of people we need, and you mentioned angels. So they are four. Exactly. Yes. So I'm going to. The, please, can you unmute me in the second device so that I can. We are now co-host on the second device, Tuma. Great, excellent. I can hear you now. Please hear me. This yes, we can hear you. The second people you need in your life, you need shepherds. Shepherds. You need shepherds. And shepherds come in the form of coaches, mentors, counselors, advisors, and um, uh, accountability partners. You need them. You need guidance. You need guidance. Nobody knows it all. You need somebody to guide you. You need somebody to shepherd you. Somebody has to groom you. Somebody has to birth you, birth the, the real you. And so you need a shepherd. So begin to look all around. Who can I latch on? Who can I uh, depend on? Who can guide me? Uh, you need a, you need, you, you need, you need, um, you need um, a shepherd. And I've, I've defined who shepherds are. I've talked about angels. And another set of people uh, that you need is that you need craftsmen. You need craftsmen. If you look at the Bible, uh, when they were trying to build the temple, they were craftsmen. And it is not everybody who is a craftsman. Um, some people are born teachers. They need to teach you. So that SPHRI, that GPHR, that CIPM, that's where the craftsmanship happens. They're there to where you acquire knowledge. So you need to learn the skill required for your profession. You can't just say, I will do it on my own. Go and seek knowledge from the craftsmen. You need them. You need them. Many of us are, are dinosaurs. We are, we are, we are obsolete. We're just struggling. Go back and acquire the knowledge for your role. If you're in HR, are you still transactional? Or are you now operational? Or you want to become a strategic HR? Go back and acquire knowledge that's required because different skills are required for the three levels of HR. The transactional, day-to-day, -day, higher fire. You're not involved in decision-making. We just tell you what to do. How many of us are there? And then you could be a patient now, which is center of excellence. I'm a recruitment specialist. I'm a talent acquisition specialist. I'm a company based specialist. Fantastic. A performance manager. Yes, center of excellence. That's operational HR. And then you could go to strategic HR, where you are really, really sitting there at the table. You're talking strategy. You're talking your people initiatives. You're marrying them together. You're taking their decisions. They depend on you as the advisor. Uh, 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 and the strategic pa people partner for that organization. Yes, that so different skills are required. So are you going to look for craftsmen that will help you? Are you going to acquire knowledge? Third category. Third category. The four people that you need who will fight for you and for your sponsors. Let me take it spiritual. You need the host of heavens to fight for you. Every, everywhere we are, there are gates. and There are people commanding the gates. In the organization you work for, there are gatekeepers. I've had a conversation with someone before, and, and I'm talking from a point of um, knowledge and exposure and experience. At a decision table, 79 people have been recommended for promotion. We look at the finances, say, yeah, I'll sit down, how much do we have? How much do we have? We think we only have 30 million to cater for promotion, bonuses, and then increments people for the new year. And then we're going to throw, we need to bring up names. This person's name, throw it off, knock it off, knock it off, knock it off, knock it off. Somebody has to fight for you. 
Many of us, it's not because we don't have what it takes, but it's to fight for you. And that's where the sponsors come into place. In the spiritual, those are the hosts of heaven that will go with you like a bat, like battle men and women. Now, when your name comes up, I say, yes, we stand for that. Yes, I don't mind. I will give this person a picker. Pick her. No, she's the one. She did, she did that. She's still the one we want. He's still the one we want. These are the sponsors. And they're available. They're available. That's the fourth category. The sponsors. They must be there to speak for you. I told them the product of sponsorship. Is when things have happened, they will now call me. This happened. We had a meeting yesterday, and this came up. The person said A, B, C, D, and the other person said the person said. But anyway, we've moved on, and we've recommended you for it. And we're like, thank you, thank you, thank you. So it doesn't it doesn't matter. You're doing well. Just continue what you're doing. Who is catching something there? Who is who has caught something with what I've shared so far? Thank you, Miriam. Yes. Miriam, can you bring that up again? You need angels, you need craftsmen, you need shepherds, you need sponsors. And the last category of people, trying to bring it to bear now, trying to bring it to bear. But I'll put it there that you also need your cheerleaders. You need cheerleaders. People that will keep you, that will keep you motivated 100%. Some people, I'm sorry, like I told you, I'm one mom will some people that have deliberately had to call because once you call them, they're negative. Once you call them, it's about gossip. Once you call them, it's about what's not going on well. I don't want to hear that. I want someone who will celebrate me in my low, in my loneliness, in my low states. Tell me how we are doing well. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. So who are you having around you? You need them. In your down moments, can any of us say, there's someone I can call in my down moment? And I can say, this is what I'm going through. What do you think? And the person tells you encouraging words. Tells you, do it this way, do it this way, don't worry, da 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 For those of my mentees, they think I'm a spiritual, but they think I'm a, I'm a pastor. I just call them up, out of the blues. And I can be talking to them for, for the next one hour. Just keep talking to them. And they will say, why did you call me? In fact, this was exactly what I did at the time. We didn't call it Not now with world's challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, I could go on and on and on. It's been a remarkable journey. And I'm still on that journey. I'm not yet, I'm not yet done. But this is the little I can share with you this evening for the worth of my experience. Thank you for listening to me, to lead to me, and I look forward to taking questions. Over to you, my dear brother, Olu Yemi Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. This is what we say that this is really what we're waiting for. Sincerely, this has been phenomenal. This has been inspiring. This has been mind blowing, and this has been, you know, I can sense that people are already experiencing a shift in their mindset and in their reality. They quality of actions that will be taken going forward and the way we'll assess situations relate with people who dynamically, drastically, incrementally, and radically change going forward. I'll quickly take Grace because she put her hands up quickly. Grace, please, let's be brief and direct, please. Thank you, Grace. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Olivia. Me. Thank you so much, Ma. My name is Grace. I'm uh, listening in or I've joined in from Abuja and I want to appreciate you first of all for just you know taking us through your career path and journey but I need um, your advice what what will you tell me who has been uh, so loyal and been in a position um, of, of management as an admin manager slash HR manager who has been loyal for so many years and it doesn't seem like I am I am progressing, even though I have taken certification courses and I'm, I'm now managing a branch of our head office in Lagos. Um, you said something about we should know when, you know, to take a bow. What what advice will you give me? Okay. Thank you, Grace. Can you hear me? Let me know. 
Yes, I can hear me. I can hear you. Excellent. So now I, I there was one thing I didn't say, and that is how why we that and that is that we need to be assertive. Now, um, assumption is the lowest form of communication. You've said so many things that you say you've done. I've done this. Yes. Great. I said you've done so many things. You've you've assessed yourself and you think you know that you've assessed yourself and you know that you put in value. The next thing you should do at this point in time to remove ambiguity, walk up to leadership. Walk up to leadership. Now, not on the basis of comparison. This is how long I've been in this organization. This is what and what I've done. These are my milestones. And these are my quick wins. These are my successes that I've recorded for this organization. I believe at this point in time, this is what I deserve. And so tell them. From the vibe you get from them, you will know whether it's actually time to take a bow. Or they will know that you know what you stand for and they will give you what you require. Walk up to leadership at this point. Thank you very much, Ma. Have I helped? Thank you. Yeah, you have a great deal. Thank you so much. All right. You Thank you to. so much. If you have any questions, final boarding announcement. Actually, it's, uh, it's not somebody even. Somebody says, would you say? Go on, somebody man. says, would you say it is wise for one spouse to be an accountability partner? No. No. Unless you're in the same career. My husband was a, is a banker, or oh, yes, retired as a banker. I'm a 